This is the first of three videos on one of the biggest questions of all. What's the ultimate fate of the universe? The answer depends on just one thing, the shape of space, or to be more precise, the shape of space-time. So not surprisingly, finding the answer to that is the holy grail of cosmology. And it involves not just physics and astronomy, but mathematics. So let's start to explore the mathematics of the universe. In ancient times, ideas about the nature of the universe were no more than guesswork, mere expressions of which philosophy or religion you happen to favour. The Greeks, some three or four hundred years BC, came up, as they often did, with a whole bunch of ideas. Aristotle argued that the Earth was at the centre of everything and that the Sun and planets moved around it on concentric crystalline spheres. All of the space beyond the Earth, Aristotle believed, was filled with a fifth element with strange properties, known as the ether, and later by medieval scholars as quintessence. The Pythagoreans, in contrast, put an unseen central fire in the middle of the universe with the Earth, the Moon, the Sun and the planets in motion around it, and beyond them, the fixed stars, and so came up with the first non-geocentric model of the heavens. Opinions differed, as they still do, about whether the universe will end at some point or whether it stretches away forever in time and space. The Vedas of ancient India, alone among sacred texts, portrayed the cosmos as going through an infinite cycle of birth, life, destruction and rebirth. Each cycle is impressively long. Carl Sagan said of Hinduism, it's the only religion in which time scales correspond to those of modern scientific cosmology. Its cycles run from our ordinary day and night to a day and night of Brahma, 8.64 billion years long, longer than the age of the Earth or the Sun, and about half the time since the Big Bang. The sages who wrote the Vedic texts had no way of knowing such things based on observation. It's just that their philosophy encouraged a belief in immense spans of time, in the same way that the philosophy of some ancient Greeks, such as Leucippus and Democritus, led them to believe in atoms. Out of all the schools of thought in circulation back then, at least one had to be near the mark by sheer good luck. Real progress in cosmology had to await developments in maths and physics that only started a couple of hundred years ago, together with breakthroughs in instrumentation that have allowed us to peer at objects further and further away. The idea that space itself is curved seems bizarre. After all, isn't space just emptiness, a vacuum or a void? How can empty space have a curvature? The geometry we learn about in school would have been familiar to Euclid, who pretty much wrote down all the rules about it in 300 BC. Euclidean geometry was the only geometry in town until the early part of the 19th century. Then a few inventive minds, most notably those of Carl Gauss and another German, Ferdinand Schweikart, a lawyer by trade, started to think that perhaps there was more to the properties of shapes than had caught Euclid's eye. Nothing got published on these ideas, however, until about 1830, when independently Hungarian Janos Bolyai and Russian Nikolai Lobachevsky went public with explanations of a subject called hyperbolic geometry. Hyperboloids see their most familiar expression in the shapes of some modern structures, such as the cooling towers of power stations, and among iconic buildings, the Cathedral of Brasilia and the McDonnell Planetarium at the St. Louis Science Center. Draw a triangle on the surface of a hyperboloid so that each side, as in the case of a triangle on a flat surface, is the shortest it can possibly be connecting two corners, and a strange fact emerges. The sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees. Draw two lines side by side on a hyperboloid, and no matter how carefully you try to make them run parallel, the lines will diverge as the distance from the starting point increases. Euclid, however, wasn't consigned to the scrap heap by these strange new results. It's just that the rules he figured out were now seen to describe a special case of all the geometries that were possible. 
In particular, it was found that there were valid situations in which one of Euclid's axioms or basic assumptions, so-called parallel postulate, doesn't hold. Hyperbolic geometry was the first example to be explored of non-Euclidean geometry, but it was soon joined in the 1850s by another kind, pioneered by German mathematician Bernard Riemann. At the time, Riemann was a postgraduate at the University of Göttingen under the supervision of Carl Gauss. For an exam known as the habilitation, which candidates had to take in order to progress eventually to become a professor, Gauss suggested that Riemann write a thesis on the foundations of geometry. Riemann obliged with a masterpiece supported by a lecture called On the Hypotheses Which Lie at the Foundations of Geometry, which he delivered on June 10, 1854. Twelve years later, and two years after Riemann's death at the age of only 39, the work was finally published by Richard Dedekind, although even then the scale of what Riemann had achieved was slow to be appreciated. In Riemann's elliptic geometry, the angles of triangles add up to more than 180 degrees, and lines that start off as nearly parallel as you care to make them will eventually converge. A special case of elliptic geometry is spherical geometry illustrated by lines of longitude on Earth. For a short distance at the equator, lines of longitude are essentially parallel, but as they extend north and south, they converge, eventually meeting at two points, the north and south poles. When we learn about Euclid's geometry in school, it's always applied in either two dimensions, the plane, or three dimensions, corresponding to the everyday space we see around us. But Euclidean geometry is just as applicable in any number of dimensions, whether it be four, five, or 83. One of the strengths of mathematics is that it isn't limited by human imagination. The same is true of non-Euclidean geometry. We can apply it to a curved surface that's easy to visualize, such as that of a hyperboloid or a sphere, or we can use it in situations where there are more than the three dimensions that it's possible to conjure up in the mind's eye. Non-Euclidean geometry in higher dimensions turned out to be just the maths needed to undergird some of the radically new physics that burst upon the world at the dawn of the 20th century. Gauss himself had been among the first to talk about the possibility of space being curved, but in muted tones. In an 1824 letter to Ferdinand Schweikart, he wrote, I have from time to time, in jest, expressed the desire that Euclidean geometry would not be correct. He showed that just a single value was needed to describe how curved a surface was near a point in two-dimensional space, a value that became known as the Gaussian curvature. Riemann took this concept and extended it to spaces with any number of dimensions. In three-dimensional space, he found it took six numbers to describe the curvature at any point, and in four-dimensional space, it took 20 numbers. Decades later, following the triumph of his general theory of relativity, a new theory of gravity, Albert Einstein acknowledged the importance of Riemann's seminal insights. Physicists were still far removed from such a way of thinking. Only the genius of Riemann, solitary and uncomprehended, had already won its way by the middle of the last century to a new conception of space, in which space was deprived of its rigidity, and in which its power to take part in physical events was recognized as possible. In the second part of his great lecture in 1854, Riemann posed the question, what kind of a space do we actually live in? There were now choices on the geometric menu other than just plain Euclidean fare. Although the space around us appeared to obey Euclid's rules on the everyday scale of things, who was to say that over greater distances it didn't curve in a manner analogous to a hyperboloid or a sphere? The English mathematician and philosopher William Kingdon Clifford was among the first to fully grasp the importance of Riemann's work in higher dimensional geometry. In a paper published in the Cambridge Philosophical Society's Proceedings in 1876, he wrote, Riemann has shown that as there are different kinds of lines and surfaces, so there are different kinds of space of three dimensions, and that we can only find out by experience to which of these kinds the space in which we live belongs. In particular, the axioms of plane geometry are true within the limits of experiment, 
on the surface of a sheet of paper and yet we know that the sheet is really covered with a number of small ridges and furrows upon which, the total curvature not being zero, these axioms are not true. Extraordinarily, Clifford suggested that matter and energy might arise from local fluctuations in the curvature of space. He also conjectured that space might be curved on a grand scale so that the entire universe was shaped like a sphere, but enclosed in four dimensions rather than three. Perhaps Clifford would have gone on to preempt more of the breakthroughs that would eventually be credited to Einstein, but he died in 1879 from tuberculosis, aged just 33. A 10-year gap separated Einstein's 1905 paper describing the special theory of relativity from his 1915 paper on the general theory. It was only during this period that he became aware of the pioneering work in non-Euclidean geometry of Riemann, Clifford and others, which would be vital to his own efforts. Einstein's crucial insight was the so-called principle of equivalence, this recognises the fact that, for instance, if you were floating weightless in a windowless room, you couldn't tell, by any experiment within the room, whether you were drifting in space or free-falling under the influence of gravity. In the same way, you couldn't tell if the room was sitting still on the Earth's surface or gathering speed through space at 9.8 metres per second per second, the acceleration due to gravity. In about 1912, it dawned on Einstein that the only way to make sure that the principle of equivalence applied in all situations was to bring non-Euclidean geometry to bear.